than Mr. Amitab Chaudhary, Managing Director and CEO, Access Bank. And to spearhead the session, we have with us Mr. Harshal Mathur, CEO and co-founder, RazorPay. So can we please have a huge round of applause? We're talking about the future of banking. So let's gather all those insights. We have with us Mr. Harshal Mathur and Mr. Amitab Chaudhary, the Managing Director and CEO, Access Bank. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to uh, request Mr. Harshal to set the tone for the session. Over to you. Hey, hi everyone, good morning. Uh, so we are here to talk about the future of banking, uh, but to set the context right, I think uh, in the last decade, the customer's relationship with banking has changed massively. Uh, from bank being a place where you store your cash and valuables, to being a place where you manage your financial relationships, to today it being an app, and sometimes not even a bank app, through which you do all kind of banking, right, from managing your money, managing your finances, managing your investments, everything under uh, through, uh, through the touch of a screen. And, and I think uh, what has happened in the last couple of years is uh, a lot of institutions like, and particularly banks like Access have played a major role in driving these changes, uh, in adopting new technologies, new waves of digitization, and going after newer markets and newer segments of the economy to completely change the way customers' relationship with banking has, uh, works. And uh, today I have uh, Mr. Amitabh Chaudhary, who is the MD and CEO of Access Bank, who has a ringside view of some of these changes happening in the ecosystem. And with the amount of uh, changes happening from a technological and innovation perspective, sometimes it, takes, it is important to step back and look at where are we heading, because uh, a lot of these changes are happening at such a rapid pace that it's hard to visualize how this will pan out in, forget about five years, but in a matter of six months or a year out. So before we start, I'll, let, I'll ask him to uh, share a short view of where he sees the future of banking heading. Absolutely. Sure. Uh, thanks, thanks, Harshal, for that. Uh, good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I have some prepared remarks, so let me just, it's better to speak with paper in front of you. Um, when I was coming here, I was wondering how should I dress up. Uh, it was a choice to be made, so I said, okay, let me remove the tie and just appear in a suit. So. Uh, I'm hopefully not looking too much out of place. Uh, talking about future of banking very quickly, uh, I think it is, there are six trends in my mind, and I'll just dive straight away into the topic. We have limited time. Uh, Harshal also wants to ask a lot of questions. So uh, I would say there are six things we should be thinking about in terms of trends, and uh, then we can look at what the implications of those trends are. Harshal mentioned that, I think in his remarks itself, that first trend is the emergence of a customer-centric bank. I remember a few years back, all of us used to talk about a digital native customer, who, which are the customers which are digital native. In my mind, that does not exist anymore because every customer now is digital native. And if you're not thinking that, how can I capture the, the customer who's accessing digital properties, digital stuff in some form or shape, uh, you will have a problem. Uh, so institutions have also evolved as well. Fintechs have obviously made several advances in this area, and in many cases, the banks have also done enough work um, the future of banking in my mind will no longer be digital or physical. The future of banking will be you being present in a form and a shape which the customer wants. In some cases they will access you completely digitally, in some cases they will access you completely physically, and in many cases they will access you in both forms and shape. And the point is that when they access you in banking or any financial services, they expect a similar experience. Even in a physical form, they expect you to give answers instantaneously as if it was a digital screen in front of them. Not that you are a human being or digital, but the expectation is similar. So customer experience expectations are similar, but how they access you could change over a period of time, so you have to be a customer-centric bank. A uh, very important another change which is emerging is emergence of product. Um, fa the financial services companies in the past have been distribution. They design a product with certain features, and the focus is how do I get it to the customer as quickly as possible. Uh, very little flexibility on terms of what that product is. As distribution becomes more and more digital, as various avenues become available to you in terms of reach the customer, not necessarily through you, but through various other means, partnerships, other channels, fintechs, and so on and so forth, product becomes very, very important. And product is no longer about just a certain benefit or a certain service. Product is about customer journeys. Product is about what can you offer to the customer which is relevant to the customer at that point in time. How personalized is that service or that solution 
becomes very important. And that's why product uh, becomes a very important trend which will emerge over a period of time. Um, to just to give you a sense for access, when I need to slip an access somewhere here and there, um, we have stopped looking at digital as customer or digital helping in digitally assisted business. If I was to just talk about pure digital business and give you some numbers, our access to, which is our pure digital business, has uh, today a balance sheet or an asset size of close to 8,000 crores and a liability side of close to 50,000 crores. Pure digital, right? Based on customer journeys, which customer access uh, themselves on their own. Uh, third big trend, uh, while all of us are aware of the India stack, and I'm sure it has been discussed in every forum here, I think what you will see in the future is a compounding effect of that stack. The people who can use that stack effectively, banks, fintechs, are the ones who are going to win in the future. And more and more of these stacks are coming. I yesterday saw the governor announce some more, you know, uh, innovation around Kisan credit cards and stuff like that. The, basically, every journey, every product, every platform which RBI or government can think of, they will create an open platform which can be accessed at very cheap or almost no cost, which obviously leads to a huge amount of dis disintermediation, but at the same time, it also means what is the extra stuff you bring to the table, right? So that will be another uh, big change. Fourth trend in my mind will be saturation, which basically means that the smaller, because of digitization, you can actually offer very small or bit size products and services to the customer. A lot of fintechs are doing it, but can you, given the size and the shape you have, can you offer such a size products and services? And can you make money out of that? That'll be another trend. Uh, it's, the question is whether you can uh, get benefit out of it. Fifth trend in my mind would be hyper-personalization. A lot of people are talking about it. But if you were to just visualize that, can financial institutions, finally in the overall scheme of things, bring the bank to the customer which is personalized for that customer? For example, you open a mobile app, that mobile app is customized to you. Not that you have customized it. I have understood you as a customer and when you open the app, it is almost customized to your requirements. Can you drive personalization to that level is what the future you know, uh, is ahead of us. And if people who can do that are the ones who will win more and more customers. And I'm not talking about mobile app, it can be anything. The more you understand the customer, the more you personalize the journey of that customer, and more data-driven you can be, will be the new future of banking. Um, another trend, emergence of real partnerships. Uh, ecosystems have been, solutions have been talked for many years now. For example, we have partnerships with Flipkart, Google, Airtel. Uh, we're going to announce another one soon. Um, but I believe in the next few years, we will see many partnerships of this nature and across products and off scale. Uh, why will we see that? Because a lot of the large financial institutions have entered into partnerships. They have seen what works, what does not work. They know how to make it work. And it is a win-win for the parties involved. So I would say that the future will also be about signing up and getting into bed with real partnerships where it's a win-win situation for all the parties involved. So the discussions will move from being very tactical to being very strategic. And everyone, at least the large institutions, both on the fintech side, say for example, or the financial institution side, will pick up and can manage at a strategic level only few partnerships. You can't have hundreds of them. Because you'll pick up those few partnerships, it is important that you obviously sign up the right ones, but then make it real and make it work. Uh, last but not the least, uh, the regulation evolution. Uh, next 24, 18 to 24 months in my mind will be a period when much more clarity will emerge in terms of what the government and the regulators want uh, and how this whole fintech will play out. And obviously, it's not that it will stop after that, but I think a lot of things still need to be clarified. We've seen a lot of activity over the last couple of months. It has meant people going back to the drawing board and looking, re-looking at their models. Hopefully in the next 18, 24 months, complete clarity will emerge. And after that, the changes will be there, but they will be more incremental rather than dramatic. But regulation, evolution is something which all of us should be aware of. And it does, does not apply to only RBI. It will happen across all kinds of regulators. So we should be prepared, and that's an important trend. And for companies who are involved in this business, it's not a question about waiting for the next 
regulation to come, but anticipate what is coming and change the business models in advance so that you can you don't get impacted by it when it as and when it comes. I think the tendency till now has been that uh, we keep doing things which we want to do and hope the regulation will not come. That is maybe not the right way. We need to change our approach. Very quickly on the implications. Um, if you want to be an organization which can become customer centric, um, no longer technology can be a support function. Tech is a business in itself, which means that you also cannot outsource everything. You need to insource a lot of the stuff. It also means that you need to have technology people, you need to have product people who think differently, you need to have people who understand customer experiences, you need to have an entire range and, uh, of uh, skill sets available with you which can actually make your organization really customer centric and understand what the new product of tomorrow could be. Uh, very easy to say all this, very difficult to execute because End of the day with the startup ecosystem, the way it is playing out in India, finding these resources is not easy. Um, we started on this journey, for example, in Access uh, more than two years back. We have about 1,000 people uh, working in just uh, digital banking alone. Um, and we have a 30-member design team now. Uh, again, we would like to expand the size of the team, but we are also trying to now create open uh, source architecture. Perhaps we are the first incumbent in the con you know, country to have our own design system. It's called SubZero. It is open source. You can go and check it out at subzero.accessbank.com. Similarly, we have a built-in you know, in-house team where 75% of our product team comes from non-banking um, backgrounds, fintech, consumer tech, IT, uh, consulting, etc. As you think about building a customer-centric uh, capability, um, it is very important to think from a customer perspective and keep improving your customer journeys. One is incremental improvement. Second is stepping back and saying what the journey could look like three to five years down the line. And both have to happen concurrently. Um, just to give you a sense as to what, uh, if you focus on it, what the change can be brought about. Um, we in Access, you'll be surprised to note, are now the world's highest rated mobile banking app. I mean, I said world's highest rated mobile banking app. We are rated 4.8 on Google Store now. There is no app with that rating. So if you focus, you can get to that kind of achievement also. Um, there is a core tech transformation also which is required. All of us have legacy systems. We need to transform the core to be able to, you know, obviously apart from the fact that it requires a lot of time and effort and resources, um, you have to have all the systems talking to each other. You have to ensure that you are nimble and you can change or do provide microservices quickly, instantaneously as you sign up new partnerships, as you come up with new customer journeys, as you launch new products, Sasha kind of products and so on and so forth. Huge investment required in core technology, which means a lot of big bucks, which means that only that many institutions can invest that kind of money in this changing trends which, which could, we could uh, potentially see in the future. We need data architecture and analytical capabilities also. Um, because it's not just about the right data architecture, you need the ability to ingest that architecture. Um, to give you a, some sense and access, we already built petabyte scale Hadoop clusters. We have about 150 use cases across credit fraud, marketing analytics on this architecture. Um, the kind of people, the kind of investment you need to make to be able to take all the data which you're getting in this open architecture platform which the government is creating. And so it is one is that you get the data. Second is you ingest the data. Third is you work on the data. Fourth is that you serve, use that data and serve an offering to a customer at the right platforms at the right time for the right product. All this has to be brought together. A customer might access a financial institution on any platform. You should be able to recognize that customer, you should be able to go back to your data, see who that customer is, what suits that customer, and offer that product to that customer. Assuming customer picks up that product, you should be able to create a customer journey which is closed within a matter of seconds. Imagine all this you want to do, what investment you need to make your core architecture, what investment you make in your data analytical capabilities. Uh, compliance, security, and speed. Institutions have to find a way to build compliant process and to ensure top-notch security practices and figure out a way at the same time to be agile, nimble, and fast to market. Not a new problem, it's an old problem, but the 
time, energy, and focus which the regulators have on compliance and the fact that they need to have uh, adequate security in place has gone up multiple times in the last 12 to 18 months. Again, the investment required to manage that expectation is huge. And again, I would encourage the fintechs, please think compliance much earlier than what you're thinking. I think you just understand the meaning of the word compliance. You have no idea what RBI means when they're saying compliance. So important to invest that time. Uh, you need to create partner-ready business models. Uh, so to be able to participate in these real partnerships, you need to have the ability to, you know, sign up the partnerships quickly and start working with them quickly, which means building APIs, building integration processes, uh, aligning yourself to the way they work, persuading them to align yourself, uh, align, make them align to the way you work. And again, a lot of work required in this area. Uh, all this, all this for the financial institutions or banks like us means that we need a clear business rationale and top management support because the amount of money, resources, focus, and the long-term potential return which this leads to or indicates means that you need to have patience and you need to have a lot of ability to absorb losses or uh, expenses for a long period of time before you actually see some results. Uh, so top management focus, top management commitment to something of this nature will be extremely important as we move forward. Um, again, being very cognizant of time and maybe the fact that, you know, I think having a question answer session will be much better. Let me just stop here. So some trends and what the implications are. Uh, wishing you a wonderful day ahead and maybe we'll have questions. Thank you. No, that, uh, that sets a very good context on where the future of banking is headed towards. And there are, it covers a, a lot of aspects of uh, where we would want to go in the session. But, but let me start by uh, first talking about the in customer aspect of it. Right? Uh, you hinted towards that and how customers' demands are constantly changing. One of the two things that I want to talk about is, uh, first is the inclusion aspect. That there are a lot of segments of customers that tra have traditionally been, uh, in, to put it simply, like not so profit generating for banks, uh, for large banks. Uh, digitization is changing that, where cost of servicing is coming down significantly. You can reach last mile uh, customer base in, in a far more deeper and far more uh, easier fashion than you could through a traditional branch-based approach. So how do you think about that? And connected to that is, as you make it extremely convenient for customers to come onto banking and digitize their banking aspect, how do you handle security? Because you have a new base of customers who had not dealt with banking in the way a lot of uh, people in tier one towns, for example, have, how do you ensure that that inclusion doesn't come at the cost of putting them at risk? <clears throat> so uh, thanks a lot for those questions, very, very relevant ones. Uh, you're absolutely right that earlier the banks would not, I mean banks, especially the private banks were very focused on the so-called metro markets. Um, in Access itself, we announced one year back that we were gonna go after an initiative called Bharat Bank, which was focused on semi-urban and rural markets, and the idea there was exactly this, that it's not just about going to the markets, but also use you know, technology and digitization as a way to access these customers at a price where you can make money. Uh, what is also happening is that, you know, I think it's an open architecture world. You can't do everything yourself. So you have to ask yourself the question, which are the partners? Partners could be fintechs, in our case could be business correspondents, it could be CSC, it doesn't matter. You, which partners you can use and leverage on to ensure that you create a bit of a win-win situation. Uh, in many cases, you will never get there. And then the cost of you getting there also is quite high because, you know, we'll come with our own requirements of all kinds of things. So I believe the future of India, especially in terms of expansion and big growth, is some of these very customers. And by the way, they are hungry for some of these services. It's not that they never wanted it. They want it, but no one was offering it to them. Uh, and they have, and they wanted money. They have been raising money from their local money lenders at a very, very high rate. For example, if they were looking for loans, they did not, many of them don't have bank accounts. And now you hear of how everyone has a bank account and they're using UPI to you know, get payments, et cetera, et cetera. Talking about security, uh, well, I mean, that is something which we have to invest in. As I said, we are obviously watching it internally. Uh, regulators watching it. No amount of money you spend there is enough. The biggest risk you worry about is what could come and hit us tomorrow. Uh, but yes, Something which I've been raising with RBI on a regular basis is that the amount of, the kind of cyber frauds, the amount of cyber frauds, the sophistication involved is going up day by day. We struggle, suffer it every day. 
and we do need to create a system in the country whereby these criminals, are, we do go after them. I think what the systems we have created till now is react after something has happened. I think the, uh, the police forces are uh, state-wise, we don't, we don't have a central authority which is ensuring that we can go after some of these criminals. I think, yes, Home Ministry has started something where they can act quickly, but we need to become much more proactive because we are seeing almost on a daily basis that people are getting frauded. And invariably, I mean, let's be also honest here, it is the greed which gets you. Someone offers you something too cheap and then you start having a conversation and then they know that you're on the hook now and they will, you know, they're smart at it. They do this every day. So they get you on the hook and obviously take it from there. Um, I have to also admit that RBI has introduced a number of measures. You look at what they've done on the credit card, the tokenization, the fact that OTP and all that which is there does protect the customers in a very big way in India. But we've still got a long way to go. And as we digitize more and more, you will see frauds. I mean, I don't know the entire background of this so-called Chinese apps which keep getting discussed, but the numbers which are mentioned are staggering. So, so yes, there is fraud is something which you have to live with. I think uh, RBI is going to come out with a campaign also soon to educate the customers. But in spite of all the education, in spite of whatever all that has been done, at that time when some great offer is made to you, you make that mistake and then obviously get frauded. Yeah. And I think uh, I, I, going back to the first point that you mentioned, I'll, uh, I want to cover more from the fintech aspect, right? Uh, a lot of last mile connectivity uh, is being built by fintechs uh, in terms of apps, in terms of ecosystems around those apps. Uh, yesterday, the RBI governor in his speech also mentioned that how fintechs can play an important role in driving access to credit uh, in certain segments of society which traditionally didn't have access to that. Uh, how do you see the roles of fintech as, uh, as somebody's running a bank, right? Do you see them as a competition? Do you see it as a way to collaborate or do you see fintechs playing on the sidelines while the banks actually drive the digitization? All of them. Uh, we obviously, as I said, it's an open architecture world. There will be some areas where we will compete head on with them. And there will be some areas where we should collaborate and we are collaborating. And there will be some areas where you know that given the kind of pipes we have, kind of relationships we have, they can provide a certain part of the service only. Now, all of us are busy. Let's be honest also. All of us are busy. You are, when you're looking at us, you are saying, what more can I do if the bank is doing at a much cheaper price and, and you know, take the market share away. We are looking at you and saying, okay, shit, these guys have come out of nowhere and they've got so much of business, what can we do? So that healthy competition will always be there. But I think the pace at which things are moving, it will be important for all of us to acknowledge and know that we are better off working with each other, knowing fully well that in some areas there will be competition. There's no problem. Um, you know, all, all of us banks also come together in some cases and work together while the moment we walk out of the door, we are fighting on some of the deals. So it's okay, we understand. So I think it's exactly the same with fintechs. And I think the banks, the moment they have clarity around this, then things become very simple. Uh, there will be a number of areas where fintechs can do a much better job than what we can. Why should we go and try to replicate it? We have a lot of other things to do. So why honestly go and try to do that? But yeah, there are some areas where we would not like to give our market share away and we'll fight very hard for it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and I think that's the dichotomy of the relationship. And I think another dichotomy of the relationship is with the regulator, right? like where, uh, where you have uh, like a lot of changes that have happened in the regulation in the last couple of years, especially when it comes to uh, banking, when it comes to fintech, when it comes to that collaboration and how, did, how does that collaboration operate. And I think, uh, and I think uh, the regulator's job becomes increasingly hard in a, in a distressed world because on one side you want to promote innovation like Avi mentioned yesterday, but at the same time you want to maintain the customer protection piece. So what are some of your expectations uh, from the regulators on how some of these, like the changes will happen, but how some of these changes could happen in your opinion? My, see, first we need to understand what does the regulator want. Uh, regulator is very clear, customer interests need to be protected. Depositor, customer means the customer will be using a service. Depositor's money needs to be protected. I don't want banks to be doing something which tomorrow could put at risk the depositor's money because then government and the RBI comes on the hook. Third is that obviously fraud and incidents of that nature should not happen. And there should be a certain way of doing, of having a market conduct. You need to do things in a certain way. If there are grievances, they need to be handled. Uh, you know, you should, should not be doing price gouging, stuff like that. So there should be clarity in terms of. If we understand that that's what the regulator wants, and no regulation can come before innovation, because if you don't know what that innovation is, how will you regulate it? So invariably, regulation will follow innovation. Uh, if that's the second principle, 
then please be prepared that if we today do things where customer is being negatively impacted, customer does not have full information, customer is being taken for a ride, miss sale is happening, RBI will come after it. Second, they will try to ensure that you come through the front door. If I'm giving licenses for something, uh, you cannot find ways, if your business model is to find ways around it, one day I will catch you. And the day I will catch you, your business model will come to a stop. So come through the front door, but yes, RBI, while saying front door is there, it's open, but getting the license to that front door is not easy. Because RBI will think 15 times before giving a license. So in some parts of the business, the license might be easy, but wherever they believe that that license could lead to a large scale, large number of customers, large requirements, they will be quite careful before who they give the license to. Uh, so they are saying come to the front door, but the license also will take time. So in my mind, if you know these basic principles, on a regular basis, you should be asking yourself where I'm going to get hit next time. And by the way, RBI does give enough, if, you, if you're listening to them and read the tea leaves, I think the regulator does, at least, at least RBI does give enough hints and indications as to what they're thinking. Now, in spite of that, if people don't think, don't listen, then their model will suffer. For RBI, banks have a certain fiduciary duty. Uh, this is the most important license. They do ask banks to do a lot of the things which don't make money for us. So they fully understand that they need to allow us to do business, certain business in some way that we can make the money to fund a lot of areas we don't make money. Right? We have a 40% PSL requirement which has, you know, 15 subsections. Uh, a lot of the, those areas don't make money. I mean, just to give you a sense, in case of Access Bank, we spend 900 crores just buying PSLC certificates every year to meet our private sector lending requirements. 900 crores is not a small sum of money. A lot of the fintechs and some of the data lending institutions don't even think about th things like this. So. Yeah, I think we have limited time, but I want to cover two aspects. Like first, uh, uh, first aspect that we want to go into is as the customer's digital needs are evolving, and you spoke about that, and, uh, and the pace of innovation is changing rapidly. On one side, you have to keep up with that innovation. On the other side, you have to manage regulations and compliances. And, and I heard the way you described your org, it sounded like a product org, that you have Hadoop clusters, and you have a design team and a product team. So it, it sounded like how a fintech org is structured today. So how do you balance that? Right? Like, uh, on one side, you are pulled down by some of these things which slow you down, like the requirements that you said. But on the other side, you have to keep up with the expectations of the market. How do you balance that? So when we set up the digital banking unit, the person who was heading it, I don't know whether he's here or not, but uh, his first initial frustration was that, you know, compliance and risk and all these old, you know, economy people are pulling me down. And I used to say, you have to be patient. We are part of a large bank. I will help you through the process. Now he does not complain about it. And my biggest worry is, has he become like access or we have managed the problem. So I keep asking him, are you, have you solved your problem or you have become like us? So uh, yes, it is a balance which you need to keep striking because end of the day, uh, you, you do have a lot of legacy stuff, legacy way of working. That is the one which is really making the money for the bank, not this new stuff. That'll take a lot of time, but that's the future. So what we did was we did set up a digital banking unit which was away from access. We give them a separate office, different look and feel, uh, but yeah, that office had to deal with some of the people here. We have dedicated a lot of people there. So I think over a period of time, the so-called old bank has understood this, what they're trying to do. And for me, the biggest and the best indicator is that they are now getting proactively pulled into some of the larger projects saying, please lead the project for us. So that is a very clear indication that, okay, things are working, they see the value. But we've got a long way to go. I mean, I think, you know, if you really want to, uh, let me put the problem differently. If today we have, uh, let's say, 70% of the people doing ops and 30% involved in technology, in the next five to eight years, we have to flip that completely. We have to have 70, 80% of the people in technology and only 20, 25% doing ops, product, and all that combined. Now, if you can do that, just that transition is a very, very difficult transition. Forget about the kind of people we'll need and whether you can hire them or not. But that's something which you're thinking about and asking ourselves how we'll get there. We intend to try a pilot in one of the uh, small areas and see how do we flip this because yeah. we have to yeah I'm cognizant of time but last and most important question right it's what is next in banking right like so we uh, while of course a lot of changes have happened but what are you looking forward to we have uh, technologies like blockchain coming into the ecosystem we have things like metaverse coming to this ecosystem so what takes next do you do we see a bank in the metaverse soon 
So some of them have gone there. Uh, you see, the basic services being provided to banking are quite boring, very simple services. So I think that is not going to change. What all these new things are doing is just providing a completely different level of service, customer journey, experience for the customer. And yes, maybe providing a solution which is so refined for that customer that their potential, that is the best possible design of the product, best possible pricing, best terms, looking at what they want, right? So personalized to the highest degree. Uh, so I think all these technologies and new ways of doing things are actually moving in that direction. You reduce your cost, pump in that cost to provide a more cheaper service and the customer benefits. And your hope is if the customer keeps benefiting, you will continue to scale and you will continue to benefit in terms of market share. The basic, basic product is not going to change dramatically. So I think, yes, the effort is just to move all in that direction. Um, some of these, what government is doing, I know time's up, but what the government is doing is that they are taking out the entire uh, PNL uh, opportunity. So if you look at payments in India, no one can make any money. I mean, you started there. You cannot make money in payments. You have to find, use payments as a platform to go and make money somewhere else. The worry is that will more and more of these emerge, uh, which will take away revenue and profitability pools, and you have to then find the profitability pool somewhere else. Now, if the profitability pool starts shrinking, then my worry is that only the big can survive. Small will struggle. That's the problem. No, that's a very interesting outlook. So I you know we are running out of time. We could, I could spend like an hour more with you. But, uh, but thank you so much for giving that perspective. I think we all learned a lot, including myself. So thank you so much for taking the time on it. Thank you. We okay. have some time for questions if anyone has any. Yeah. Uh, morning, uh, gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Amita, for very, very lucid and very pointed, uh, uh, you know, pointers that you have mentioned. You mentioned about compliance in your in your note, uh, so I just want to understand that. Is it that you're talking about a word of caution to the fintechs for their own compliances, or is it that? Uh, banking industry per se is struggling uh, on the compliance front and you want fintechs to help them uh, in their compliance management or in intelligence. You know why I'm asking this question because all throughout 40 years I've been into banking and as a CEO leading some of the banks there, this was my biggest problem that I always used to worry about. Am I complied? Um, am I, you know, the entire territories that I've been working? So, from that point of view, thank you. I think the second part of your question is very, very relevant. Fintech firms can play a very important role in compliance. Maybe they're not, uh, you know, focusing on it enough because they don't see revenue opportunity. I would say it's a huge revenue opportunity of the future because the compliance requirements are only going up. And it's compliance is very broadly defined. I mean, you know, you, it goes from the gamut of uh, compliance related to how you conduct business to security to all kinds of stuff, right? So, uh, and by the way, again, our regulator has done a great job in terms of ensuring that they can pick up as much data as possible directly rather than someone supplying the report. So whatever they can do to help uh, uh, will be a good business opportunity for anyone. And all of us need help, I will admit that. Because not that we are in a bad shape, we are in a reasonable shape, but the compliance requirements will keep going up. And so whatever can make the journey easier is always helpful. Uh, as far as the first part is concerned, I would say that fintechs need to move from understanding the meaning of word compliance to actually living it. I don't think they do that uh, today based on the conversations we have when we sit across the table and we talk compliance. I think they, they, they are saying, yeah, we understand the meaning. Why are you wasting our time? And I'm just trying to say that please make it part very early on in terms of what your business model is. Because if you don't, um, a tsunami will hit you one day. Because the regulation will come. And by the way, RBI and all the other regulators can be extremely tough. Extremely tough when they want to, right? So uh, my view is that I think enough attention is not being paid. I think we have examples in front of us based on some of the regulations that have come out, which very clearly indicate that the business models have been stopped in their tracks. So I think if we could anticipate that, could hear it, and change our business models accordingly, it will obviously uh, help in the overall sustainability of a lot of these fintech enterprises.
Uh, hi, Mr. Chaudhary. Hi, Harshal. Priyanka here from Money Control. So I just wanted to ask you, you know, like you said, a lot of fintechs are not living compliance, but now there's sort of more clarity with the digital lending norms. Some more is awaited when it comes to new banking platforms and what RBI thinks in that area. Uh, has the bank's uh, view on fintech partnerships sort of changed uh, since the regulations have come or uh, anything uh, more that you expect in terms of, would you like to wait, wait for more clarity? No, view has not changed at all. I think they have a very, very important role to play. I think, yes, there was a level of, quite a level of difference in your understanding of what compliance meant for fintechs and for us. I think these regulations have helped them come on the same plane, or in the same room, so that is helpful. Um, uh, because I think they've got a clear message from the regulators that they have to comply. Uh, but no, I absolutely no doubt in my mind that fintechs not only have a huge role to play, they'll have continued to have a huge role to play in the future and we need to work with them. I mean, so that is not in doubt. So does the regulation open up any more opportunities for the bank also? Because now there's more... Clarity. See, we see any new regulation first through the lens of, oh God, they've stopped one, two, three, four. Right. That's the first reaction. But I think over a period of time, we realize that a lot of these regulations, once clarity emerges, what is required, new opportunities do come up. So I'm 100% sure that both banks and fintechs will come up with new ways of doing that business. And ultimately, the only way you will succeed is you're giving something to the customer, which the customer can see and touch and feel and say, yep, this is, this is better than what I had before. So I think new opportunities will emerge. I'm quite confident of that. Thank I you. think that's uh, my view as well, that I think what regulations have done at the end of the day is make it more structured on the kind of partnership you can have and make very clearly defined roles and responsibilities, which I think at some point was needed. Uh, so I, I don't think it stifles that collaboration, it makes it more structured. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, one question from here. Yeah. This side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so I'm Anju Bala here. I have a very simple question for you. See, as a common citizen, no. I am making all my payments through digital mode, whether it is to the driver, to the cook, grocery, everything. So my question is that whether the printing of currency notes have gone down during the last few years, and if not, whenever the ED rates happen, we find crores and crores of uh, currency uh, uh, stock. So what, what kind of new regulation is required to discourage such kind of uh, stocking of currency? Well, I'm not, uh, you know, know enough to talk or comment on ED and all that, but yes, the currency in circulation has actually gone up post-demon. So a lot of cash is still being used in the system. A lot of transactions are still cash-driven. And you would have noticed that both the government and RBI are working very hard to ensure that the cash in the system and usage of cash in the system should be brought down. Because, you know, cash could inevitably mean that they're escaping the tax net, Government doesn't know what's happening. It impacts the monetary policy also and all of that. So my view is that government does want to bring it down, but there are still a lot of people out there, a lot of companies out there who um, want to deal in cash and customers are willing to deal in cash for them uh, because they save some tax here, they save something here, somewhere else. Uh, but as you would see from these raids, if you were to take that as an example, I think the message to the people who are doing this is you might escape today, but the very good chances is that you will get caught tomorrow. So why do it? And once you are caught, then all this ill-gotten cash is basically impounded. So you can just watch it from far. You can never use it. So. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Navin. Uh, I'm a budding uh, fintech co-founder. So, uh, like when RBI says that credit needs to be pushed and the more people who haven't had yet access to formal credit need to have that, how are bigger banks looking towards this sector considering their comparison towards, say, smaller, small finance banks who have better access in tier 3, tier 4 and more regional sectors? So, how are the bigger banks looking to collaborate uh, with small finance as well as the fintechs who probably work in the space in getting the access to these kind of folks? So, you have various, I guess, categories of institutions who are catering to this. There are obviously fintechs who are doing it. There are small, you know, there are payments banks, there are false finance banks, and there are, you know, scheduled commercial banks. Um, at some stage, depending on what, you know, step of the ladder you are on, you do run into scalability issues. You can be a small finance bank, you're called a small finance bank for a reason. Once you reach a certain scale, you suddenly realize, oh God, where do I go from here? Because I have issues on liability side, I'm not able to raise that many deposits. 
I have issues on yes, uh, I have gone and extended this credit uh, to a lot of the people who need the money, but I'm t my risk profile is high because if things go wrong, then my entire book starts looking quite weak, and that we saw that during COVID time. So at some stage, they either need to come out and become a full-fledged bank, or at some stage, they get sold out. So my view is that what the larger banks are doing is that they're themselves going into some of these markets. Uh, if you were to look at our, for example, MFI book, it is as large as most of the independent MFI institutions today. And by the way, it applies to the other larger banks also. Nothing unique about us. So either they remain at that size and that start growing at a certain lower rate, or at some stage they sell out. And you've seen a lot of MFI sell out. Uh, so it's an evolution of the market. It is how... Uh, you know, each of the uh, sectors in across the world work. Uh, you, you grow up to a certain size. You are, some of them are able to kind of break the ceiling and become even bigger. Some of them are not, and they slow down, or, and they stop growing, or they sell themselves out, and then go and do something else. I'm sure you, once you sell your fintech, you'll do something else. Yes, uh, Mr. Chaudhary, thank, thanks for your insights. Myself, uh, Raj Jairaman, I head products for QPS, Q Processing Services. Uh, I don't know if the question is relevant, but uh, is cryptocurrencies in your radar or is there thought process going around cryptocurrencies? We have obviously, we are watching the space quite closely, uh, but the regulator, I'm sure, has, has made a lot of public announcements about what their view on crypto is. So, broadly, the banks are very, very cautious in terms of touching that sector because the message from our regulator is beware and be aware that we don't like it. So we are acting accordingly. I but don't from, want to say more. But from an infra standpoint, if at all the regulator relaxes that we can go crypto. I uh, don't think based on whatever I have seen and heard, the regulator is going to relax. The view is very, very firm that we don't like this. Got it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great. So we'll end the session here. Thank you. Thanks, Amitabh. Thank you very much. And if I could please request both of you to come together for a quick photograph as well. We'd like to thank uh, Mr. Amitabh Chaudhary for joining us this morning. And we'd also like to thank Mr. Harshal Mathur for speaking.